Hey guys, uh, welcome to Mini PC, Small Computers, Big Talk, or Big Talk, Small Computers, and we got some big talk going on. In this episode, it's brought to you by John Isle of Tiki. I guess he's a buddy of Jonas, right, Dor? Uh, he's down on the uh, Big Island, yes. Uh, 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 um, why, uh, supporter Podnuts. And I'm sure if he could right now, he would tell me we need to do more episodes of The Makers, and I will say... I'm trying my best. Um, more will be coming out. Just a question of when. Um, Brian might be joining us here in a little bit. Uh, I know, uh, you know, summertime kids, family, lots of stuff going on, but we cannot even begin to start to avoid the actual headlining news of the week. Dun, dun, dun. Um, about 48 hours ago, uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 was officially launched. Dude, I, I am so excited about this, and I know I'm probably the first one to trash the Raspberry Pi Foundation, but this one I am super excited about. The The big thing for me, just absolutely personally, um, I want a dual display. So as far as the specs go, it does two 4K displays, It'll run two at 30 frames per second. It'll run one at 60 frames per second. So that's a big F and win. That's well, I am. It technically, the port technically supports that. Everybody so far who's done tests are not getting close to those numbers. Uh oh. All right. Now, now I'm not happy. All well, right, so it's 4K. I mean, off of a board that costs 55 bucks. For the you four know, gigabyte board, yeah, yeah, I'm going with a high number, fifty five dollars, mm -hmm. and to expect to run two four K monitors, you literally are unrealistic. That's yeah. The, a lot. Back in the day, the cables cost more than the board. If you're going to get two uh, HDMI cables, yeah. yeah. Um, do me a favor. We're going to stick with that right now about the dual video out. I hate running dual monitors on everything I've ever owned in my life. I'll much rather have two monitors and two separate computers and use a KVM or a okay. software KVM. Yeah, Synergy. Right. Oh, well, I'm not using Synergy for the rest of my life. It's, it, oh, it's, okay. it's dead to me. It's closed source now. But why do you run dual monitors and why would dual monitors on such a low powered computer be uh, desirable? Okay, for me, what I want, so I use my Mac as like a desktop computer, and I 3D printed a dock for all of the cables on the left side, so that's power, USB, and then the two display ports. So for my desk to be operational, I have to plug my Mac in it. I'd love to be able to just sit down at my desk, hit the keyboard, and have it come to life. And if I had a dual port, you know, dual display, I can power both my displays and I have a device that's going to do it. Basically have something act as a thin client that I could VNC into my other devices if I needed to, that I could use Synergy or whatever the open source forked project is uh, you sent me earlier today. And, you know, connect to other devices in my, to me, it's a gateway drug. I mean, a gateway device. Hey, hey, Brian. So that's really where I'm going with it. Hey, guys. Now, the the other thing that I'm excited about, so maybe the four dual display ports isn't a winner. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, maybe they come up with, you know, firmware upgrades or software upgrades to the OS to make it better. Uh, I'm hoping they hit the mark, and, and I'm hoping it's, you know, not a disappointment. I guess the good thing about this, one of the predictions I made for 2019 is there will be no new pie, and I'm happy to eat that crow. I'm microwaving it right now. Uh, so the couple of cool things about it compared to the Pi 3, if you're familiar with the Pi 3, the Pi 3 was 1 gig of RAM. This has a 1, 2, and 4 gig of RAM. Uh, uh, single board computers that you can buy. It has full gigabit Ethernet. The Pi 3 had a gig 
Ethernet hardware port, but it was connected by USB 2, so the max speed you got was like 300 megabits. Uh, so this is full gigabit Ethernet, I'm guessing, because it's hung off the USB 3 port? No. Uh, you're saying no? Wait, what's it hung off of? No, it's its own bus. Oh, okay. All right, good. Even better. So uh, the I'm very happy about two USB 3 ports because you can hang, you know, uh, disk drives off it and get uh, SATA speeds. You can hang a gig Ethernet uh, plug off it and get gigabit Ethernet speed off that. If it was four USB 3 ports, I'd be a little more excited, but two is real good. No, two, two. The, you're not going to get full USB speeds off of both ports. That's already also been tested, and uh, you're only okay. going to get around 300 megs. All right, all right. So it's not like I can plug a bunch of disks in and, and get full speed on each disk. Because one of the experiments, side note, uh, I with the Odroid N2, I did an experiment with LVM, which is Logical Volume Manager, and it has four USB 3 ports, and I plugged a different type of disk into each one and made one volume out of it. So that was kind of cool. I think it might be a shared bus on Whoa. that USB 3 auto. That audio is not very good, Brian. Oh, sorry. I think you're coming through both the Chrome uh, um, um, Hangout and Mumble. It's what I'm going to guess. And while you're just doing audio check, let's let's get it sorted out and continue. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I'll say I'm glad they came out with a device. Okay. I'm glad they came out with the device they came out with. But, but it's obvious now they've basically given up on the third world. Or they've given up on the idea of bringing poor people out of poverty and bringing them into today's culture. It's painfully obvious. They now only care about first world is the way that I look at it because no third world person needs dual 4K output. That is just completely useless as far as they're concerned. Oh, right. So is yeah, USB I, 3, I, so is USB C, so is Gigabit Nick. They no third world country hmm. needs any of that stuff. You know, I thought you were going for the different the different pricing on the RAM that it's thirty five, forty five, and fifty five bucks. I'm like, no, they could buy the thirty five dollar version. Okay, so actually, I was going to critique you on that, but that that is kind of a good point because, yeah, the th a lot of people in the third world aren't doing dual display. They're they're not doing gig Ethernet. They're probably lucky to have Wi Fi, huh? And the power and the USB C is is nothing they have sitting around already. Right, right. That I'm sorry. That was the third point I was going to get to. Is yeah, these things. If you hunt for them, you can find a three watt USB C on Amazon for ten bucks. But you got to hunt for it, and you know who knows if it delivers ten uh, three watts. I'm sorry, three amps continuous, fifteen watts total. You know you don't know that. Yeah, and I'll say um. You know, I'll put it like this. Like, um, the last governor election we had in this state, I was literally perplexed. As a government employee, I wanted to vote for the Democrat because he, in historically in my state, Democrats always give pay raises How's to government sound? employees. Still touch loud, but better. Um, they always give pay raises. They never short projects. They never say no to big contracts. So it's good for my job. Um, and then on the other hand, as a taxpayer, I want smaller government. I want money savings. I want cost efficient use of my tax dollar. So it's like, you know, do I vote for my job or my career or do I vote for my state and my, you know, family kind of thing? Same kind of thing to me with this Raspberry Pi. Um, as a first worlder, I love the fact that it's gig 
Nick. And even if it isn't true gig Nick, which I believe it is as close to true gig Nick we've seen on any mini computer, uh, the USB three, 300, uh, uh, megs read, write is fine. That's great. That's like literally 10 times as fast as the last raspberry Pi three external storage. Um, the USB C power I personally like because that means this is still one of the few mini computers I can literally run off of a USB phone battery backup kind of thing and not have to have a wall wart directly into it all the time. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. The processor is at least three times as strong as the last Raspberry Pi. I love that. Is now I feel comfortable telling everybody. If you ever tried a Raspberry Pi in the past and for any reason it didn't meet your needs, we are now at the point where this Raspberry Pi can probably meet your needs. This is as close as we've gotten to a desktop-like first-worlder experience in mini computers for less than 60 bucks, I, I think, so far. And I'll say this, I hate the idea of dual monitor, but I talked myself out of it, Rich, on the way home. While, you know, wife was complaining about my driving, I'm driving and thinking. The reason I like dual monitor on this board is the reason I hate it typically is because if one screen is bogged down, the, the other screen's bogged down because they're both using the same processor. But with this, I could dedicate one monitor to, to just remoting in to a more powerful system and then have one monitor dedicated to the Raspberry Pi desktop. So then I could do all my heavy lifting on a second computer and all my light browsing and light email stuff on the Raspberry Pi computer. So I'm actually okay with actually having dual video output and actually going to try to use it on this board. So as a first worlder, I'm rejoicing, except for the fact they're still using micro SD cards. No EMMC, no NVMe, no nothing else, just frigging old school SD cards. So the SD cards are still third world. So they're following what is known as, uh, at least I'm familiar with it, as the Porsche model. There is no entry-level Porsche, and Porsche says if you want an entry-level Porsche, buy a used one. And so what you can do is the Pi 3 is $25 now, and you can pick that one up. Don't forget, you can still boot to, uh, to hard drive, too, as well. You don't necessarily have to rely on uh, USB. I mean, you can SD card. TFTP boot also. Yeah, right. you can boot USB, you can boot uh, over the wire. So, you, Joy, you had mentioned uh, they had completely forgot about the third world country, the third world countries with the uh, Raspberry Pi 4, but I thought the original um, push behind it was to get um, Britain or uh, England or Britain going with uh, programmers, you know, getting kids excited by programming, by introducing them to hardware and getting, being able to tinker around with it um, on a very extreme low budget. So in $55 isn't really that bad, to, to be honest with you, I, in my opinion, for what you're getting. I, I agree with, for what you're paying, it's still a great, tremendous value. I do think, I will say this, I do think you're at least mostly right. When it was first, first, first launched, it really was more, it was just education, I think, was the actual first, like, press release on it. I think it became, shortly after that, at least in my eyes, as being a, bringing the third world education level up much quicker. Because, honestly, in Britain, in the United States, in Canada, in a lot of these countries, the so the schools are packed with Chromebooks and iPads already, so they don't really need these mini computers for educational purposes. Of course, you can have them set up, you know, clustered servers and stuff, which you can't do on an iPad or a Chromebook. So it still does serve an educational need. I just would like them to still have a ideal of, you know, lifting a percentage of the population up. Um, and I will say, um, uh, more than a couple of people were upset at the fact that the USB-C was only used for power. Uh, I'll say I'm okay with the USB-C 
being a power only kind of solution. And I did forget, I'm not going to lie that you could boot to over the network or straight to USB. Now here's the question. So if I'm booting to external storage, do I just leave the SD card slot empty? And then if I do, I don't understand how it knows to boot to external storage. So you got to run a command on it that um, resets a bit in the, there's a program read only, wait, wait, there's a one-time programmable memory spot that allows it to basically change the boot order to boot over ethernet. So it'll look to that as a boot source for a TFTP server. So I don't want to say BIOS, but like BIOS, like there's something in it to basically just points it to. And, and actually on the Pi 4, there is more of a BIOS there now. So Gotcha. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of firmware updating you can do on the Pi 3. And I, I think the Pi 2 also might, might be all of them. Well, I'll ask you, Brian, what are the features on this that uh, caught caught your eye that you think are interesting or the real significant upgrades for this? And I think Brian dropped out. Yeah, I'll say um, I love the fact that it's finally four gigs of RAM. Yeah, the, the four gigs of RAM is a big deal to me because actually I'm trying to install OpenSUSE, the latest version on one of my Pi 3s, just to test out virtualization. So I'm ready for when I get my Pi 4. Well, and that's one of the things I think is true. I think uh, appliance wise, you need the RAM in order to do stuff. For basic server needs, if you just want to host a next cloud instance or you just want to host an IRC instance, or you just want to host a web server kind of thing, you don't, nobody needs four gigs of RAM for that kind of stuff. In reality, the only time I know of where you need more RAM is when you're hosting a database or when you want to do graphic intensive video stuff kind of thing is when you need the actual RAM. Are you back, Brian? Yeah, the uh, mumble chat locked up on me. Sorry about that. I, I blame Rich. Um, so, so what do you think on this are, are, are like the game changing upgrades? So in my opinion, the uh, gigabit ethernet is a game changer. And I, I know you don't like it, but the dual HDMI is a game changer because this brings 4K um, display, uh, dual display to your, uh, to your screen. So... <clears throat> It might. I don't think it's going to be fantastic at 4K, 30 frames per second, but I think it'll be amazing at 1080p with a dual display. So you know, if you're running something like um, uh, some kind of a monitoring software where you need to, you know, keep an eye on your um, hardware, um, uh, like a Nagios or something like that, I think it really comes in um, really handy with something like that um, at an extreme low budget. And, um, and being able to spend, uh, to send, you know, above the two to 300 megs per second too, again, with the, uh, with the ethernet and the fact that you have uh 3.0, uh, shared bus on the three dot USB 3.0 is not really that bad. Um, you know, a heck of a lot better than 2.0 using it as a, a network attached storage. So I think th the device itself, the, the 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 Raspberry Pi four, which that's bringing to the market, is going to be a real, in my opinion, a game changer in in, in performance as far as uh, desktop performance. Using it as a uh, you know a secondary uh, PC or something for the kids to give it to when you you know or a kiosk, and also a uh, a really good component for Open Media Vault as well too. Um, Again, not having two or more drives on it, but one very large drive, I think would come in handy, or maybe perhaps throwing a hat on. I'm, I'm curious what the performance will be if you had a, uh, a hat that would give you uh, more bandwidth, perhaps. Um, I'm not really sure, but I, I will say I do think if the RAM is going to be the significant like first world upgrade, and to me, one of the bigger news announcements are, was almost hidden. 
Um, if I didn't watch explaining computers, uh, dot com video of it, I believe I wouldn't have known about it. And the second link in the notes, uh, is going to be, um, line, um, 957. Uh, it was a posting on the raspberry pi.org website. And it's basically the first 48 hours after the device was launched. And what it is, it's it essentially like, what did the news update cycle look like it? And they basically link to every prominent YouTuber doing any kind of review of it. Uh, whether it was explaining computers, um, blitz city, D Y Y, uh, explains it all. Um, eight bits and a bite, uh, low spec gamer, the magpie magazine, um, so they basically like go around the horn. So if you're a video person, this is the link you want to go to where it's everybody showing you all of the things off about the Raspberry Pi 4. And I honestly like the idea of selling a desktop kit, a kit that comes with the Pi, a keyboard, a mouse, and video cables all included. And the fact that the keyboard also acted as a multi-port hub uh, to USB 2.0 hub was just another nicety. Um, and without sounding dumb, having a red and white Raspberry Pi case, a red and white keyboard, and a red and white mouse was a very nice touch uh, for people who want it to look nice and not just be a you know microcomputer. Yeah, I'm really. It's good for okay. branding. Right. Yeah, the, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, as we you just clearly displayed, running down the list. Uh, if you're a YouTuber, if you are, you know, into uh, technology, when this thing launched, it's like, it's like Christmas, <laughs> you know? So the Raspberry Pi is like a, a, a game changer, um, and it's clearly displayed. And like you said, uh, Rich, um, it's good advertising. And I, I really want to make mention of that uh, keyboard with the hub on it. I think that's awesome. Um, and especially well, the size of it. That's it what beautiful. Apple did. The desktop bus back in the day was, uh, I believe it was USB. And you connected your keyboard to the computer and your mouse to the keyboard. And it doesn't have to be high speed. No. Right. Yeah. It just needs to work. Um, and I can see people literally abusing it because really that's all you need. Um, I, day one, just went and ordered the four gig version um, apparently if you buy the one or two gig version, you would, you're supposed to get it quicker is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but I will say that's not, not the real news. And I don't think I have a link to the next bit of information, but it, when you get the device, I want everyone to look at the device, open the box up and look very carefully at the box because there's a space on the box where it could be checked, marked off eight gigabytes. What? So wow. people are speculating that either somebody made a mistake and there's never going to be an eight gig version of the Raspberry Pi four or somebody made a mistake and they accidentally put it on the box early. So there might be a rev in four or five months or six months e plus uh, maybe. And I'll say this. You want to talk about appliances to do virtual hosting management that with the eight gig one might just be like the sweet spot. See, I, I've been trying to communicate. When this came out, I have been for like a year now. I've been trying to communicate with anybody I can at VMware because they came out with ESXi, the hosting, you know, the VMware host for the Raspberry Pi. Now, it was running with one gig and there were certain things you could do with it. It really wasn't good for hosting. But I'm like, I don't care. Give me some way to compile it for other ARM devices that I have that have four gigs of RAM and maybe better CPUs. Now that they have this, the first thing I said is, yeah, now I can do virtualization on it. I can run Home Automation Assistant. I can run Observium. I can run all of these things on one box. Or with ESXi in a cluster, I could run them on two boxes simultaneously and have fault tolerance going on. You know, the, so my system never goes down. So I'm I'm all geeking out, excited, and I read somebody say, well, four, four gigs is still not enough memory. I'm like, no, 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 it's enough for me. 
It's enough. And, and when I say me, I don't mean me personally. I mean me as someone in the single board computer community that is running Home Automation Assistant, is running Observium, is running, gosh, what else? Uh, a PBX on it. Um, all of these types of things is very exciting. Or PiAware, you know, all of these things. Rich, I fully agree with you, man. I um, I want to say that the the big news to the story that the Raspberry Five, the Raspberry Four, is here, is that the Raspberry Pi Three B Plus, the prices are going to go down. I believe they're already twenty four ninety five. That's twenty five bucks. That's really awesome. I mean. I was going to get one like every other week for like forty five bucks, you know, including the uh, the case and the uh, sixteen gig uh, uh, card there. SD card, yeah. Yeah, so I was dropping forty five bucks a whack, and I'm I'll be more than happy to spend a little less money to get the same the same thing I'm getting already, and you know, in addition to getting something even fresher, like you said, with uh, four gigs of extra RAM. Oh yeah, yeah. I I mean I'm very excited about this. Uh is it a complete win? Eh. Is it super good? I'm like, yeah, it's super good. It's yeah. it's real good. I'm very excited. I'm curious why they went I know you mentioned this before with the uh USB C that it's only used for power. Why they didn't go with the barrel connector instead of uh using USB? I, I think USB-C will be more prevalent in the future, and there's going to be more legacy USB-C chargers kicking around in the future. Currently, no. And and I kind of agree with Dor. Uh, like, USB, even the powering it with the, the micro B connector, you still had to have enough higher amperage connector, and most phones weren't up to the spec for that. So that was still a tough reach to get something that was going to power a Pi 2, Pi 3 uh, for the amperage that it was going to require. But there are... All right, so I still could take a USB-A to USB-C cable and power my Pi device. Uh, I just got to make sure I got three amps. Yeah, I'll say um, I appreciate them having the price be a touch more and not having a friggin' barrel connector because a barrel connector is only ever useful with a very, very, very small percentage of things, period. One thing that they learned with micro USB was you didn't have to worry about power supplies. You didn't have to worry about what happened if your power supply got damaged. You could very easily get another power supply. With a barrel connector, doesn't matter where you're at in the world. It only gets more difficult to get a barrel connector, the right kind, the right size, the right shape, the hole in the middle or not the hole in the middle, the right amperage, the right voltage. Oh, oh no, it's just painful. USB-C is going to just become easier and easier to get as time goes on. Now, the hope is, the goal is to me, they stick with this connector for two or three years or however long yep. you know that they can. Thus, it just be even easier in the future when you need to power up your Raspberry Pi 4 or 5 or 6 that you already have the power supply for it. You don't have to go spend more money for it. But, um, and, and, and I'll say this one little side thing. We have the Rock 64. Rock 64, 4 gigs of RAM, gigabit NIC, USB 3 versus a Raspberry Pi 4. The real truth is you cannot compare them. You cannot compare the numbers. You cannot look at the devices, look at the numbers on each of the devices and compare those numbers and get a realistic expectation of what to expect with each of those devices because of one big thing. Hardware is only 50% or less of the end user experience. It's how optimized, how polished, how good is the software running on it. And while I'm a huge fan of the Rock 64, I don't know if it could ever be as polished as a Raspberry Pi official Raspbian type distribution. So I ignore the numbers. And all you got to know is if you want the best experience, the easiest experience, the most seamless experience with the most updates, with the most upgrades, with the most flexibility, with the most community support, with the most everything behind it. And, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of money, Raspberry Pi 4. 
uh, right now is going to be the one to beat. Uh, and it's going to take a while for something to, you know, come on the scene and again, make us think how the pie is weak and the pie is lame and the pie isn't doing enough. But for right now, it clearly to me, wears the crown. So you do make a good point there. Support software support is a big deal. Um, the hardware wise yes do do we have more powerful better hardware out there for a year two years more years yes uh the rock pro 64 with a pci bus is crazy good and you can get it with up to four gigs of ram and so there you know if you have a pci bus all of a sudden there's cool things you can do or um, who did I see? McMake just reviewed, I, I forgot what it was, but it had an M2 card on it. So you were mentioning earlier that it doesn't have EMMC. If, could you imagine if there was a Pi 4B plus with eight gigs of RAM and an EMMC card? That, that would be fantastic. Or an M2 card slot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. And here's the thing. I hate to say it like this, but like to me, car manufacturers every year only I personally think try to do just a touch, just a hair better than their competition. They don't want to do too much. They don't want to go too far. They just want to do just enough. And to be honest, that's how I look at this board. Yes, there are definite things they could have done. Dota could have literally blown everybody out of the water kind of thing but they didn't need to uh they could have expanded the g um g um gpio stuff for more compatibility they could have had more connectors on board for more type of sensors uh, they didn't need to they could have had emmc realistically on most of the boards when you put an emmc on the board your speeds are not insanely better than sd cards which is, it's a bus thing, but it's very hard to get crazier fast speeds from EMMC versus SD. Um, they could have went with, you know, a faster, better type of RAM. They didn't need to. They could have went with dual NIC. You know, I don't think they needed to. I think they said in the interview how they looked around their offices and everybody had dual monitors when they were doing work, when they were getting things done. So they made that their internal priority. Um, Personally, I would have went with something else. I'll say that, but I understand I'm not the normal person and nor am I the target person. But um, I do think that if you ever hesitated in the past or you got a Raspberry Pi and you were dissatisfied with it on anything, on boot speed, on you know how the graphics looked, on how anything ran on it, I'm telling you right now, this is the time to give Raspberry Pi another chance. Well, not if you're coming from NVMe. So if you're coming from NVMe, then uh, you might be a little jaded. But if uh, if you're coming from an old PC, I think you'll be just fine. And I mean, we have, and we, we still have plenty of stuff coming out this year. We still have the Pine Tab, the Pine Book Pro, the Pine Phone, those three. Um, in the notes, there's still like a half a dozen other mini computers that were just announced in the last, you know, week or two. I got a question. Do you, and I didn't look at this yet. Do we know if the, uh, that four gigs of Ram, is that dual channel memory or single channel? I thought it was DDR four. Yeah, but it can still be single channel DDR four. Um, I honestly think it was dual channel. Um, when I went and looked at it, um, um, life hacker, in the notes, uh, it's going to be basically our third link, 958 in the notes. Uh, Lifehacker had, to me, one of the most comprehensive, impartial looks at the Raspberry Pi because they point out negatives and they point out positives. Um, they tell you about all the different things. Like in the very beginning, they even tell you um, how uh, it's people reviewing it so far are like having a hard time getting uh, uh, streaming 4k type content, um, over the Nick and how it runs hot. Like they literally have like a heat gun mm -hmm. looking at the infrared and you can see the Raspberry Pi four is definitely running 
a it's little an bit hotter. Pie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to need a, a, maybe a little fan or a bigger heat sink. Uh-oh, did we lose Brian? No, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah, it sounded like you cut out cut out early. Um yeah, so okay, you're you're gonna have to cool it. Here's here's the thing. The truth of the matter is anytime you go higher end on the computing, you're gonna use more power, you're gonna generate more heat. That's that's how it goes. That's the fine balance. Yeah, I I mean that that's that's what we've suffered through with data centers since the dawn of time is you know, back in the bad old days, I think it was MIT, they heated with the computer room, a lot of the dorms. They just pumped the heat into the dorms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something Google would do. Yep. Um, well, I'll say yes about the heat thing, but no. I mean... Grand scheme of things, look at computers five years ago versus today. We are producing insanely less heat for the same amount of flops coming out the other end. Um, but when you're dealing with stuff, to me, so compact, so close together, it is super difficult to not uh, go up in heat. And the, the, they're over three times as fast processor in the benchmarking. So to go up that substantial amount of processing power and to not have a lot of extra heat would be really amazing. I will say it looks like when I'm looking at the heat stuff, I don't want to say it's fine, but it does seem fine. And it does look like, uh, at least on Tech Republic, they do say it's a dual, um, dual, um, dual um, channel 4 gig LPDDR3 I866 RAM. So that's good. Um, and I, I will say, if you want to go through this Lifehacker article, I really do encourage people. They they give a very fair, here's the good, here's the bad, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, uh, rundown of the Raspberry Pi. And it's definitely one of the longer articles. Um, if you go about halfway down, it, it does say it can handle 4K display, but dot, 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 dot. Uh, and it basically says like people trying to stream uh, over at Tom's hardware had a, a difficult time to get 4K H.264 encoded video to stream great. But just like you said, Brian, if you want to run like 1080p video, you're going to have no problem running it. And to be honest, that's all I need to run is 1080p. Right. I agree. But And I'll put this out there. One thing I'm not seeing anybody comment on, and here's to me is the real wild card question. Here's how you know, here's when you know Raspberry Pi to me has truly made it. Is are we finally going to see a genuine, actual, factual, endorsed, official, Google branded Android operating system for this Raspberry Pi? Because if we do, I'm going to tell you right now. This device will sell three, four times greater than any other Raspberry Pi. You think so? I mean, the yeah. Android OS is uh, really shines when you have a touch interface, um, and not that you can't do touch with with the Raspberry Pi because you can definitely do that. But I see it more. More as a maker thing and more as a, a desktop thing. You you think that would really make a huge game changer? Um, considering right now for a Chromecast Ultra, you're paying nearly the same price. Uh, if you want to hook this up to a TV and have an Android like experience, an optimized Android experience, I have been, I really feel kind of comfortable in saying it would be a really good experience if. If they put the work into it, optimize it, and get the interface uh, smooth, um, I, I think it could be like the ultimate easy home theater kind of device. Yeah, and towards the very bottom is where they show you the um, USB read write throughput. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 3A was getting 38 and 36 megabytes. 
and the Raspberry Pi 4 is getting 363 and 325 megabytes. So it's literally about 10 times faster. Yeah, I love those numbers. Yeah, so as like a NAS type device, um, the logic is NAS type of device, four gigs of RAM, gigabit NIC, this kind of read write speed, it really could be like a, a really, really solid Plex media server or just a network attached uh, a storage. And, and I'm going to say this once, I'm going to say this a million times in my life. If you don't have root, you don't know who does. Uh, if you have a Synology NAS or some other manufactured device, you literally don't know who has root on your device and you literally don't know any security vulnerabilities on your device whatsoever. If you have Raspberry Pi, you install noobs and then you install something on top of it. You at least know who has root on it and it, it's you. Well spoken, Dor. Yeah, I will say um, I've fallen in in and out of love with uh, Lifehacker, but this article by David M Murphy literally today at 2.15 p.m. was published. To me, was one of the best articles I've went through in the last like six months in its thoroughness. I really hope he actually knew early about the device coming out because if he didn't, he really put this information together pretty um, quickly. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I was able to take a Raspberry Pi 2 and install, I think it was uh, Ubuntu Mate. And on top of that Ubuntu installation, I was able to run GNS3, which is a network simulator where you can actually run uh, simulation for uh, Cisco devices and Juniper devices. Uh, some pretty like heavy duty equipment. Um, <clears throat> and I thought that was kind of cool because I could actually interface the network card into um, an, an existing Sienna, an existing Cisco switch and create my own Cisco lab using GNS3. Um, you know, without buying additional switches and being able to keep the heat down and the cost down with uh, with power. And with the updated Raspberry Pi 4, that just gives me more horsepower and more uh, RAM to run additional Ubuntu uh, Mate OSs on uh, uh, running GNS3. So you can have at least, you know, three or four of these running not in a cluster, but you know, running on a, on a single network, and being able to build like a really cool Cisco lab. You know, if someone was really interested in, in getting their Cisco certification, um, without spending a ton of money on hardware, and you can do that with not killing your 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 electricity bill too as well. That's what I was going to say. Is yeah, you might be able to like your data center upgrades, and they just put this crap on the loading dock. And, you know, you get the stuff for free, but then you got the power and the noise, which is going to be an issue. Yeah. And I, I've, I've had many labs where, you know, you have four or five switches and, and routers. And that stuff adds up after a while. It gets hot. It gets noisy. It, uh, the cost is crazy. You know, my wife's yelling at me about the electrical bill, so I have to shut half the lab down and bring it up when I, you know, when I want to use it. So it's just a pain in the butt. But uh, using something like a Raspberry Pi, it's just it's awesome. Yeah, and the um, Life Hacker article says the average person uh, upgrading from a three to the uh, Raspberry Pi four would see a difference in cost of about three dollars per year of usage. Which, uh, didn't, yeah, that's not even to me worth worrying about One or talking about. Yeah, I think I lose three dollars a year by accident. <laughs> Are you married? You lost more than that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and I will say in the live chat, we got a couple of people here. Um, Joe Lakata is asking for the link to that um, 
GNS3. I do believe it's in our show notes from a previous show. Brian, if I can't find it, I'll ping you for it. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I just the- Googled GNS3. I found it. So it's, it's an easy search. So did I. And the first three links, at least when you go through them, the links die and they don't work. Um, the only other Raspberry Pi stuff that basically I think is worth, I don't want to say it was worth talking about, but that should be talked about at least. Uh, and I was reminded by this, uh, from an email from Joel from, uh, the Linux link tech show, um, is, um, JPL. I don't know if you guys heard about this. Apparently there was a advanced persistent network threat sitting on the JPL network, Jet Propulsion Laboratories, a.k.a. NASA, uh, for over a year where people sucked but, off of but their But you know network. what JPL doesn't do? Security? Security? No, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, do you know what they don't do? Well, they don't do jets. What's they that? don't do jets. <laughs> they don't do jets. <laughs> Yeah, but the um, basically they had a advanced persistent threat on their network for over a year. It looks like, uh, and that threat pulled off about 500 megs of data, which really doesn't sound like a lot of data. But when you look at the actual contents of what was sucked off the network, it was pretty sensitive files regarding Mars missions. Uh, so that's really not good. And the reason we're talking about it is the advanced persistent threat on their network was a uh, rogue raspberry pi uh put on their network and basically wasn't recognized for about a year so So yeah i i know how we deal with stuff i'm shocked i am completely shocked it goes back to what you said as your first answer they don't do security uh i mean something like that on my network within seconds the network port would be shut down yeah, that, well, that's it. At least have something notify you that something was on the network. And maybe once a quarter, I don't know, go through and do some auditing or something. Uh, just have some even MAC address. Right, right. You want to have a MAC address inventory. I For all of the people out there that aren't super network geeky, um, MAC address is the media access controller. And it's, uh, what is it? It's six pairs of binary alpha, let's see, hexadecimal, hexadecimal. code. Yep. Thank you. And typically the first three of the manufacturer ID and the last three are random. Most devices you can actually spoof a MAC address, which is what I did for a long time to get my headless Roku working in a hotel room. Um, I would spoof the MAC address with my um, Macintosh. I would change it to the Roku's Mac, log into their, you know, 24 hour thing, and then change the MAC address back and plug in the Roku or fire it up and it would connect uh, Wi Fi and work. But all that being said, um, yeah, so the MAC address is what, uh, it's basically what they call the hardware address before you get an IP address on an Ethernet device or a Wi-Fi device. Wi-Fi also has a MAC address. Well, everything has, everything has to be addressable. It's like an IP address, except it's only used on the local LAN kind of connections. Right. Yeah. And it is unbelievably easy to spoof, but yep. I don't believe it was. That's the thing. I really hope somebody comes out and says, it was a Raspberry Pi hooked up. Uh, it was hooked up to like a camera, hopefully to just like watch a coffee machine maybe. And then maybe they just accidentally left default credentials on it. I don't know. And that's how maybe, got, I don't know. I just know this does not make me feel good. Um, it reminds me, you know, Baltimore city, eight, 18 plus million dollars in the whole, uh, Riviera so you know Beach in Florida, Florida 600,000, yeah, a couple, of, a couple yeah. of towns in Florida. Yeah, well, you know, with those, all you had to do was apply patches on your operating system and you were fine. This sounds worse. Even even with, uh, you know, this ransomware, really, if you have a VLAN that segregates important information from stuff and there's no route from, you know, a clerical level person from clicking on an email, I I mean, we have... 
uh, regular email spoofing attacks. Like it'll it'll come through. It'll have all of the branding and credentials of somebody on our network. But if you look at the address, it's not our domain. And it's like, hey, we got a problem with your vacation time. Please click this link and fill out the last three days you took vacation. You know, stuff like that. Or they'll have an announcement about the parking and then they'll send an email about parking and please click here and it's not our domain trying to catch us and keep us on alert for fishing expeditions right well i mean it's you know life imitating art uh the show mr robot this was how they um uh got into the uh backup facility where all the big backups are being stored was with a rogue raspberry Pi planted on the device. Um, you know, uh, I hate to say this is the kind of thing that happens, but with computers becoming more ubiquitous and easy to install, easy to play with, easy to distribute, um, this kind of thing, I guess is going to happen every now and then. Um, and, and, and the easiest fix they said, uh, in their summary, uh, was all they really needed to do was to just have, more subnets, smaller subnets, more isolation, network isolation. Uh, I'm not a network guru, and I and I even understand you don't max out every IP range. You literally have uh, units, sections of smaller ranges of networks to where a device on that one subnet can only access things on that one subnet without explicit permission. Well, and, and that's like VLAN, so you can do the same thing with that. Yeah, they, got, uh, they call it network segmentation, so you definitely want to have your VLANs and uh, access control lists as well, too, to uh, segment the, the network. So traffic can't right. route certain directions. My last job, they had shared drives, and the shared drives were shared throughout the corporation. Lord, hopefully nobody hears this. Well, what would happen on a regular basis, and, it, and it's pretty easy to have a stray mouse click and you drag a folder that has like a terabyte of files into another folder. And then I get the call. It's like, hey, uh, the folder blah, blah, blah disappeared. It's like, oh, frick. Now we got a bug hunt for the folder and do a restore. And then you have file names that are so long they violate uh the microsoft rules for file name length you know file and path names that are too long yeah yeah anyhow fun being a network geek and i'm like uh can we change the permissions so you can um actually change how that works so they have to okay when they change a large amount of files, they're like, yeah, we're not doing that. And I'm like, okay, enjoy it when it happens next time. I think they call that insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Yes. <laughs> and, and how it would work is it would be some, some admin in the C-suite and it had to be done immediately because the company could not work without those files. So this wasn't like, oh, why did you break this? It's like, you got to drop everything and get it, get it fixed immediately. Oh, oh, I got a C-suite story. Can I tell a, a side story? We're on a call. I'm not going to name names or companies. Um, but the... Somebody announces that they're a Microsoft person. They used to work for Microsoft and they're getting in charge of doing something for the C-suite with Linux. And he says, I learned all sorts of new words like Ansible, Chef, Puppet. And then he says, I also learned that there we have many different distros. It, like distro, like bistro, not distro, like distribution. <laughs> Was he from and, a different part of the country? <laughs> and threw out the entire call. I couldn't tell you how many times he said distros. I was, I was like biting my tongue. I was smashing my foot into the ground. I was like ready to run out of the building and yell. That's like someone saying, "Yeah, it's uh, it's data." 
It's not data, but it's data. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't even that. Nobody, nobody says distros like bistro. Everybody no. says distro. I I know somebody that does a podcast every once in a while for Distro Watch. I, how how is it said? Am I wrong, Dor? No, distro no, Watch. Right. Yeah, it's Distro Watch. Distro Watch. Has anybody ever said distros? <laughs> no, no. Not if they're <laughs> new. <laughs> Russ Winter was a host of that, and Bruce Patterson's a host of that. And neither of them pronounce it like that. Not they're brand new. Never heard it before. One's oh. from one's from Philadelphia. One's from Boston. 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 Where you park the car. And he right now, I'm pretty sure, is still all amped about hockey. And Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts is awesome. Yeah, um, I got to bring this link up in the notes to um, 960. Um, this article, I want to say, was just published today. Let me do a quick look here. Um, uh, June 25th, yesterday. Um, basically, uh, it is basically some malware called Slidez, S-L-S-I-L-E-X. I'm going to say SLEZ malware. And basically only thing the malware is doing is it's going after orphaned IOT hardware with default credentials, logging into those devices. Then what it's all it's doing is it's going insane writing to uh, dev slash null uh, as fast as it can, as much as it can, basically instantaneously aging the device and ruining all the internal storage and, uh, and basically just bricking the devices. Um, I will say, again, if you don't have root, you don't know who does. And when you have um, uh, improper IoT devices that aren't updated and aren't maintained and use default credentials and have well understood algorithms for credentials to how to get into devices uh, and you ha and you put any trust or any reliance in such devices um, it will just become useless either by natural selection or by some type of uh, mass infection like this uh, um, so yeah, um, I encourage people, if you do have IOT devices that you do not control, you definitely get them off of your, uh, main network, uh, quicker than later. Yeah. Either have a, you know, old router on a different network or a VLAN. I remember buying a scale a while back that was a Wi-Fi connected scale. It was pretty a top-notch scale that I paid a lot of money for. And I wasn't paying attention when I bought it. When I brought it home, the wireless standard that I could use it for was 802.11b. Not G, not N, but 802.11b. And I'm like, really? But <laughs> first of all, Who's using 802.11b? <laughs> Something very old and probably very cheap is what I'm going to guess. Um, the next link I'm just going to mention in the notes, especially if I can find it. Um, yeah, okay, it's going to be uh, 961 here in the notes. Um, and this is by the threatpost.com. I don't know if you guys have ever seen threatpost before. It is a security focused um, website. I don't want to say it's like highly respected or whatever, but I've heard of it before is all I'm going to say. Um, and basically they're, they have like interview with researchers who are basically insisting that you take your old, you take IOT devices that you're not positive or getting updates and you literally throw them away because like, that's the only good place for them because the flaws are just growing 
millions by the month and there's no way to fix them because you don't have control of them and the company decided it's not in their best interest to put any time or effort into updating these devices. So if you bought yourself, you know, some light bulbs or, you know, some control switches for power outlets or some sensors or some uh, self-contained cameras that connect to the internet kind of thing that you don't explicitly have ownership thereof. Um, This at least is one group of people that are insisting that you literally throw the devices away. And that's some really solid advice. I, uh, I, that's a really good article door. I can't stress that enough. That's uh, (laughs) some pretty sound advice. It's not worth hanging on to old IOT devices. Especially these days. It's better to roll your own if you can. See that I'm a firm believer of, you know, a couple of things. One, if you don't have root, you, you don't own it. And two, I don't like any of my home automation IoT crap phoning home. I want to have complete control over it where it does what I want it to do and it stays on my network. Well, I'll say I'm okay with it phoning home, but I want the option of letting it phone home. And I still want it to function if I select for it not to phone home. Right. right. I mean, sometimes I want to support the company and I want to give the company more data to improve the product and innovate the product better. But not if it's like a smart clock in my bedroom. You know what I mean? No. Right. When you're the product. Yeah. And I do have to go to a piece of good news i'll say that line line 962 in the notes um this is good news i will say that but unfortunately this is the kind of good news where we're not going to see any kind of payoff for this for maybe two to three years uh sciencedaily.com i don't know how many raspberry pi mini computer focused podcast or content that anyone else out there watches who is going to reference sciencedaily.com. Um, but there was a big um, milestone in memory uh, here just about two days ago. Uh, we've been suffering with uh, DRAM forever. I'm going to say for 30 years. Um the corner, the market of DRAM is basically cornered. It's its own thing. It's well established. It has the um, uh, normal ups and downs of any type of uh, siloed industry because there's not been real innovation in DRAM for 30 years. It basically does the exact same thing it did. They're just closer together and they have better error correction and you know slightly faster access and that's all they've ever done. This is an actual innovation that can change how RAM is handled, accessed, and utilized, partially because uh, it's going to use, if I, if I remember correctly, it's going to literally use less than 50% of the power needed by current RAM standards of today. Amongst that, they also believe it's going to be able to give us faster access rates with less error correction involved with it again. So... In the future, when we say 8 gigs of RAM, it's going to be more like we're getting 12 gigs of RAM, but with the speed of, you know, 2 gigs of RAM. Because to manage 12 and 16 gigs of RAM is a task upon itself that requires lots of work. So sometimes smaller RAM is actually faster than larger RAM just because it's easier to manage. With this future innovation in RAM we are going to be able to have better performance, better accessibility, less error correction needed, and still utilizing less power. Um, Well, they're actually saying that we're not going to see it widespread until 2025, but it's coming. Wow, that's a really good find, Or It's like uh, reading that... uh important little news story that's tucked away in the corner of a newspaper. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm sorry, I was wrong. It is expected to use 
100 times less energy than DRAM. Okay. Yeah. So we were talking about heat in the beginning of the show, how there's, you know, you, you, you use more whatever you're going to use more heat. Well, when you use a thousand, a hundred times less energy, that also means you're going to use a lot less heat coming off of that device as well. So uh, this is going to be like a game changer in RAM. Uh, it's going to take years for it to actually hit, but this is the kind of thing where, of course, once it happens, uh, we're all just going to take for granted this is how RAM is going to be for now on. Yeah, I got to check this article out. I love it. What's the expectation? Twenty twenty five. Yeah, hopefully, I would say before that because stuff seems to be moving a little bit quicker than what everyone else is saying. But that's what they're saying. I think we'll have a uh, a station on orbiting the moon at that time. Project Artemis. Um, and here's another one that caught my eye. Uh, Nine seventy in the notes. Uh, Because this was an article that I literally had to read the headline like five times because this is not the kind of article I expected to see. And it was from PCGamesN.com. I never heard of them before, whatever. Um, But Samsung negotiations to produce Intel 14 nanometer Rocket Lake CPUs are in final stages. So. Intel is now looking at offloading some of the production of a specific chip over to Samsung. Um, I don't know if that's like accepting, I don't know if that's like Intel accepting defeat, but it kind of smells like Intel accepting some kind of defeat. I don't know. Well, who, who's the number one manufacturer, CPU manufacturer on the planet? It depends on how you slice the pie. You didn't ask enough details. It's just like I was in a meeting yesterday with two guys from Google who tried to say in the meeting, Kubernetes is the number one most installed piece of open source software. It's the most successful piece. I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, what do you think it is? I said, well, how many, first off, how many installs do you think you have? And what do you think the number two is then? And they told me a number. And they said what they thought the number two was. And then I had to inform them SQL Lite has 10 times the installs of what you say you're Absolutely. at. Absolutely. So you're not even close to the number one most installed. You might be the number one most installed piece of like orchestration software, of containerization software, but no way, shape, and form, just flat out number one open source. And I would really appreciate sure. if you would stop saying those kinds of things. And of course, everyone else in the meeting is just like, what's well, SQL Lite? <laughs> everything your watch your phone your uh pretty much if it has a cpu in it it's got sqlite well and like even if you like download um an application on windows typically it has sqlite embedded in the application as a library to use as its own solution like i honestly believe even like steam the desktop client to manage your video games is actually running a SQLite instance on the back end to manage your games. I think it's everywhere. It's literally everywhere. Yeah. Your watch, your phone, your car, your, your tablet, what any application running on them is, is probably got SQLite in the background. Yeah. And there was a couple more boards that came out. Uh, I believe if I go into, I want to say last week's board. I don't remember if we talked about it, but I want to say um, a Seuss Tinker board is coming out with a new version of uh, their Tinker board. I do not remember. Oh, yeah, Wasn't we did talk about TPU. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we did talk about. It. I just wanted to, I just wanted to yeah. make sure because a Seuss was one of those manufacturers I gave a very hard time to about how they weren't going to support anything in the long term, but apparently they are trying to keep everything up and keep coming out with more products. So uh, if you guys glance through the notes, do you see anything else that uh, catches your eye on it? 
And uh, in the chat, who do you know who's using SQL directly as an end user? Me. I use SQLite directly as an end user. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, Cold Fusion, Lucy, uh, Rilo, uh, all use SQLite. That's, that's part of the install. Right. And then if you want to just count direct usage, then you can't count Postgres or you, you know, can't mm-hmm. count up a, um, a, um, a, uh, Apache. You can't access it because you're using a browser, not the server. I mean, and, and that's the whole thing. And that's why I try to explain to the Google guy. You have to give caveats whenever you try to say the best of something or the most of something, because it's never that simple. There's always more to it. You can say the number one most installed open source server product or something like that. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. But you know, you, 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 to say just such general terms to me is begging the like grammar Nazi kind of guy to come out. Um, there will, there was more in the notes. There was a newer banana pie board announced. Um, banana pie board, BPI M4 uh, built on 8 gigabyte EMMC uh, Bluetooth Wi-Fi. Unfortunately, only one gig of RAM it looked like on the board. Uh, we have a, a, a strawberry uh, pie hat, which is a, a, a hat for IoT automation on top of Raspberry Pi. That was pretty cool. Uh, we have a rock Pi S, a tiny SBC, nine dollars and ninety nine cents, powered by the Rock Chip thirty three oh eight, like a really true like nano computer size computer, like one of these guys, you know, inch and a half by inch and a half computer. Uh, we have the GPD um, P two uh, Max eight point nine inch mini laptop. Uh, unfortunately, it's like. 300 bucks um but you know uh, we have endless stuff uh coming out in the mini computer world but um it's really hard to beat that headline of the uh, raspberry pi 4 Yeah, I'm sorry. The um, GPD uh, 8.9 inch, five hundred and twenty nine dollars for the Intel five. Celeron model with eight gigs of RAM and two fifty six uh, internal storage, and a seven hundred and five dollar version with sixteen gig of RAM and a five twelve uh, solid state drive. And all less than nine inches. Wow. It, th- so this is like a micro netbook. It is, except yes, netbooks were historically unbelievably weak. Um, GPD is a company, to be honest, I am a true fan of. Uh, They make um, my uh, mini Android gaming system. They've made micro palm top devices in the past. All of them have gotten good reviews kind of thing. They even have uh, like a 3.5 inch uh, uh, foldable computer that runs Windows on it and you can play games on it. This is now they're going for a slightly bigger size, but definitely looking at packing some power in, inside of it. So I'll tell you what this is cool for. Again, I hate anything smaller than 14 inches. Uh, but back when I wasn't dependent upon reading glasses, something like this would be great. You know, it'd be great for commuting on the train. If you got a train ride and you want to whip, whack, whip something out and be productive with it. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic thing and no backlit keyboard i always had a problem with the keyboard yeah with these things as far as uh, not just the backlit keyboard but just uh, having the keyboard being so small that i couldn't type fast enough on it yeah i'll say they try to do a good job with the keyboard where uh the keys that are not full width or full height are keys mm-hmm. that are less popular on the keyboard but um yeah it, uh, it's going to take, it, it would definitely take practice. Uh, and it looks like the webcam is actually in the hinge, possibly, uh, which is. So you get the different. nostril photo. Yeah. 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 And just a really quick side comment um, Pinebook Pro, 
uh, one of the announcements they made was you'll be able to select your keyboard between, uh, I, w- I want to say it was literally called ANSI standard or ISO standard. And if you don't know what that standard is, it doesn't matter to you which one you pick. Uh, because all the standard is, is, is the enter return key a rectangle or is it a rectangle with a little like thing coming off the bottom of it? Which uh-huh. I didn't even know there was different keyboards like that. I, I didn't know they had names. Mm-hmm. Well, if yeah, right. If if that's the decision point, yeah, it doesn't make a difference. No. Just take my money. Well, um, you guys don't have anything else on uh, the notes catching your eye. We're gonna close this up. Yeah, we've run for a good amount of time. I, I think that's a good show. Okay, Brian, if uh, people want to contact you, what's the best way? You can uh, send me an email over at uh, Pod's Not, Pod Nuts, or you can look me up over on Instagram. Ask the cable guy. Very cool. Uh, and Rich, if people want to uh, contact you? Yeah, drunk in any dark alley. Uh, no, uh, if you go to flyingrich.com, there's uh, my social media hub. <laughs> <laughs> and uh there's a contact me page uh so you could always send me a note there very cool very cool uh send an email all you gotta do is shoot us an email to mini pc at podnuts.com uh thank everyone for contacting us if you want to send us a voicemail at 7076 podnut if you want to support us just uh in the uh, uh show notes you can go to patreon.com slash mini pc uh, any and all support is always welcome. Um, I am going to finally turn on uh, the Patreon so we actually earn 12 bucks a month. Um, that is po- uh, patreon.com, the mini PC show. Link will be in the notes. Uh, and we will talk to everyone again, hopefully, real soon. okay we are still streaming oh thank you guys for coming out yeah that piece of software rich honestly the first three things i went to all of them died oh really i, I thought that, i hit it off right on the bat i all uh, i searched was raspberry pi GN, gns3.com mm-hmm. yep. yep so i found gns3.com community yeah. discussion yep. gns3 on raspberry pi raspberry yep. Yep. every every link on them when you click it doesn't go through you click that and then it ah. says and then on the very top it says raspberry pi.org and gns3 on raspberry pi powered by Alkin. of course you click the link bank page not found oh so i don't know what i'm missing and that's the thing there's no way something that damn useful is not being kept up mm-hmm. you know because this is yeah yeah to say it's useful is like you know congratulations captain obvious <laughs> you know so all right in the chat says i want a thin and light laptop that i can use for ssh and video playbook that's why i use my 14 inch acer chromebook for 200 dollars, and you can run a linux subsystem on it just kind of like the linux subsystem for windows i believe it runs in a docker container or vm i'd have to hold on i'll take a look right now so you're saying download mate install the image do test configuration sudo app g parted install gene shut down and power up your pi insert micro sd card after you boot you need to breathe because it just works the same as the ubuntu sounds shut down and power up your pi then insert the ubuntu micro sd card after you boot and log in installing gsn's breeds 
install Python, install Python, install Python, CMake, uh, download and unzip. Okay, so let me click there. Ah, they want your information. You gotta log in to download it, it looks like. Create a free account. <laughs> yeah, that's not cool. I hate that kind of thing because you never know if what you're gonna click and download will work. Because no, it's a pretty reputable site. I've downloaded uh, GNS3 when, a few times. Well, no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is I don't see a date. Okay, yeah, this is June 28th, 2015. Debian and Raspbian has changed a hell of a lot in four years. And they're still showing you four-year-old instructions. I worry that the instructions won't work like it's telling you to install like for instance python 3 ws 4 py what if that doesn't work right in this version i mean there's always little gotchas like that 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 can come up that's why i would just like for them to offer here's just a disk image download the disk image put on your sd card and there you go Yeah, and the last posting to this was June 5th, 2018. Cannot import Q cannot import QT modules. PYQT is probably not installed. Is the error message he got when he tried to install PYQT5 QT WebSockets. And because this is proprietary, there's no way you can install it with DietPy or anything, which sucks. DietPy is the crack. Uh, that's a problem. DietPy made stuff too easy. It literally oh, yeah. spoiled yeah. me. That's weird. Oh. Text files. That's not confusing. Download. Delete. <sighs> wow, my head is hurting. Okay. Now in Raspberry Pi forums, first impression, how to install on that, and then how to do a Beowulf cluster. But of course, page not found. Same one was removed from the gns3.com's forums. Yeah. I'm tempted just to look on, um, what is it, bug me not. See if I see login information. I use that, I think, too often. And when I look in the search i'm finding asterisk on raspberry pi l-e-d-e -E on raspberry pi ip fire on raspberry pi sdn 101 huh can't say i know this okay so question the uh... Uh, YouTube chat was uh, using, hold on, 
I also want to use a Pi 4 as a hardware firewall. So you would have to use a USB 3 port with a second Ethernet uh, jack, which I use mm -hmm. those things all the time. One of my favorites is the Amazon Basics USB 3 gigabit uh, jack. I, I think it's like nine ninety nine. Well, technically, um, you don't have to. You can have multiple IP addresses on one port, but, but yeah, you could port forwarding. But you're yeah. Well, it, it isn't forwarding. It's you can just have you can just bind two IP addresses on a single NIC, and it's fine for a firewall, but you're going to get half speed on everything. Um, yeah. I mean. So one of the things, actually, I, I did a YouTube video on the Atomic Pi, and you could put, what is the software? The, uh, 